Gender equality is one of the fundamental values of the European Union and Member States have taken the obligation to move towards the equality. Today I am meeting here in New York with Distinguished Professor of Sociology at Stony Brook University, uh, Michael Kimmel. His books include Manhood in America, Cultural History, The History of Men and many others. Good afternoon, Michael. Good afternoon. You are very well known in Europe for your work relating to gender equality in America. But when it comes to gender equality issues, uh, the European Union and um, United States in the global context, they face uh, quite often similar issues. Yet the, yet the ways uh, challenges are tackled are different. How do you, as an American researcher, position gender equality in both research and policy debates in the EU and US? Well, uh, there are a lot of different ways I can I could answer this question. Um, I think that the issues that are uh, important for us to be under, to, to be discussing are fairly similar. Um, for example, I mean, just off the top of my head, I would say that the ways in which the arenas in which uh, men are engaging around gender equality, the types of projects that have been developed in Europe, in in the United States, around the world. Are, are address similar issues, uh, violence against women, reproductive health and rights, HIV risk reduction, involved fatherhood, uh, men's health, uh, education of boys. Um, th these are uh, work-family balance. These are certainly issues that are global issues. Uh, different regions, different countries approach these questions differently because uh, of different kinds of configurations of different actors or uh, whether they are state actors or NGO actors or other institutional non-state actors or, or uh, pressure groups or social movement groups. Um, so for example, one of the biggest differences, I think, um, is if you took the same issue, uh, engaging men around gender equality, around workplace and family life, uh, the balance of work and family, engaging men as fathers early in the process, that is to say, parental leave, etc. Uh, encouraging men to be very active fathers. These are, these are the similar issues that we're facing here that, that you, you would face in a European context. However, what, what the European context has that we don't have is a state sector that promotes and encourages the men's engagement with gender equality, that provides parental leave uh, for, in various ways, that supports women and men Taking, uh, taking family time. Whereas in the, in the US, as you know, we have no state policy for this. It's all corporate based at best. So there are large numbers of men. In fact, the majority of American men have no access to any parental leave. And nobody in America, as you also know, has any access to paid parental leave through the government. They may have some through their company, they may have some through their educational institution or whatever other, uh, other institution, but they don't get it through the government. So here's a similar issue that has a tremendously different configuration of actors engaged in it. Similarly, you know, I, you, you could make the same kind of argument around violence against women, for example. You could make the same kind of argument around uh, reproductive health and rights. So the, so the, so the constellation of actors state actors, NGOs, social movement groups, unions, uh, policy making groups in general. Um, that configuration is going to be different in the, in, in the European context than the American context, although both are facing similar kinds of issues. And ironically or interestingly, a set, a set of projects designed precisely to engage men given the kind of configurations that we have. Only a couple of weeks ago, the European Institute for Gender Equality presented the results of the new Gender Equality Index. This index measures gender gaps which are adjusted to the levels of achievement in the EU. Uh, these results uh, show us clearly that even though in the EU there is a political will uh, to work on gender equality, and that is combined with uh, legislation in place, we are still very far away from gender equality. What were your first reactions when you heard the results? Um, envy was my first reaction, probably. Um, you know, it, 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 when, when I've seen the, the, this index, for example, or the World Economic Forum's ranking on the Gender Equality Index that the, that the World Economic Forum does, I always, you know, the, the U.S. is usually positioned around number 20 
Um, and if we were to take the European baseline, the average for the EU in, in, your, in your index, the U.S. would be significantly lower than that on most of the indicators. Um, it's always the case that the top countries on gender equality are almost always European. In fact, the top 10 are, with, with two exceptions, Australia and New Zealand, all European countries. So in some sense, of course, as an American, I'm envious that um, the constellation of those, of, of those different actors have come together to produce uh, the conditions for greater equality in Europe than in the United States. But there's two parts of this. There's, there's the political will, as you're suggesting, that, uh, that indicates that, that, that those actors are acting in some way in concert with each other, coordinated with state sector and, and private sector and, and uh, different arenas. But also, what we're, what, as an American, of course, what do I focus on? What's our great contribution to this? Individual motivation, of course. That's what we do. Um, we rely entirely on individuals deciding to do things. We offer them no support, but we, we want them to be motivated. Well, that's often what's missing in the European context, is you have a, a, a very elaborate platform um, but you, you don't inspire individuals necessarily to take advantage of what might be available to them. And so what I think, you know, this, what this index in illustrates to me is that, the, uh, is that A, that there are dramatic differences among countries, B, that there are some similarities within Europe compared to other, other regions in terms of support for various for various projects. And the next step, is, it seems to me, is to inspire people to want to take advantage of the policies that are offered, to put, to put pressure on for even greater expansion of these kinds of policies and rights. So I would say that what's, what's often missing that, that we, can, we contribute is the kind of uh, psychological motivation to, to, to uh, initiate these kind of changes. And here, of course, your index is very useful because what do we find? we find that not only are the most gender equal countries the ones that have the higher standards of living and all that, but also the lowest levels of depression and the highest levels of happiness. Now, that should speak to the motivation part. I would like to avoid depression. I would like to achieve happiness. Well, by supporting gender equality, I actually get to do that. So when I see that the most gender equal countries are the, are the happiest, or when I see that the least gender equal countries are the most depressed, have the highest levels of depression, that creates in, in individuals a kind of motivation to participate in these kind of projects. Knowing the results for the EU and based on your previous work, what do you think needs to be done for gender equality on European and member states level? Um, well, I, I sit in a, in a sort of odd position. Uh, because I'm, very, I'm centrally located within all of the gender equality research and projects that are going on globally, I would say that globally um, different regions have identified and respond to different issues most centrally. So for example, if you were in sub-Saharan Africa, the single most important sort of pressing issue around gender equality would be on HIV risk reduction and its relationship to violence against women. In the EU, it's work-family balance, involve fatherhood, workplace issues. In, uh, in South America, it's almost all reproductive health and rights, projects around reproduction, around maternal health, paternal health. Um, in the United States, of course, we're the world leader in thinking about and researching and producing discourses about violence against women. That's the one thing that we're good at. Um, so our, our rates are, of course, way higher than rates of violence against women in Europe. So we each, I think, each of these regions can learn enormous amounts from each other about the, the places where we've been strong and the places where we've been weaker. Um, the discourses about violence against women, for example, in the EU lag behind th those conversations in the United States in terms of taking responsibility for thinking about it, thinking about violence as a, as a mechanism of gender inequality rather than bad people or psychological problems or whatever. In the same way, both Europe and the United States can learn from Latin America about how to engage men around birth control, for example, around reproductive health um, for both women and for men, 
uh, because that's where, uh, been a place where they've been strong. Not because their governments are particularly interested, but because of all the aid money from foundations like Gates and Ford and all that, that that's where they're putting their, their money is reproductive health and rights. So projects engaging men will naturally fall there. Um, at the moment, of course, Europe, Asia, Africa, the United States, Latin America are all facing crises where we're suddenly aware of the extent of violence and sexual assault. So here I think we have a, a, a sort of a common issue. We've ignored it for a long time. We haven't really known how to respond to it. Um, and so we need, we need a concerted effort because gender-based violence it has similarities, whether it's in, in, in rural India or in you know, New York City. And those similarities need to be explored. Given this context, how would you frame the debates on men and gender equality? Why is it important to have men on board and why should we focus also on men? But this is really, this is a tricky political question, Christian, because, um, uh, you know, this is one of those glass half full, half empty questions. If you focus on the half empty, that it's not yet full, if you focus on the gaps, where women lag behind men, where the inequality is, what you will often do is, uh, is, is you are expressing something that's true, but you'll lose the men from the conversation. Because the other side of that conversation is also true. It is true. I, I, I think without, without fear of contradiction, I could say to you categorically, women and men have never been more equal than they are in Europe today. Right? It's the highest level of gender equality ever. Right? So if you focus only on the places where there's still work to be done, you're going to lose the context that women and, you know, of the tremendous strides that have already been made. And if you do that, you're going to lose men. Why? Because these changes have been so fast and that, they're, that they've, they've left us kind of dizzy. And so men are trying to figure out now, how do we articulate with all of these dramatic changes? The, I mean, think about the, the difference in Europe or the United States in 2013, just from, say, 1913. You know, the difference is around racial equality, around immigrant status, around LGBT equality, around, around gender equality. It's amazing and amazingly fast. It's in our lifetime that everything's changed. So if you tell men now, oh, and by the way, we have tons further to go, they're going to go, well, wait a minute, you know, what about us? So I think you also have to attend to where men, what men are feeling. Because if, in fact, and I think this is true, this, the, the chief obstacle to racial equality has been the behavior and attitudes of white people. The chief obstacles to, gen to sexual equality has been the behavior and attitudes of heterosexuals. And of course, the chief obstacles to gender equality have been the behavior and attitudes of men. Unless you bring men along into that conversation, they will feel that there's nothing for them in the future, and therefore they'll be more prone to be resistant. Now, I think we need to make the opposite case to them. Just as we make the case to heterosexuals or to white people, that a world of greater racial, sexual, or gender equality is actually a good thing for men. It's a good thing for workplaces. Diversity is actually generative. It's more productive. People are happier in a more diverse workplace. This is all true. We have all the measures of this. So how do we make the case to men if we say, despite all this progress that we've made, we still have so much further to go that we have to think only about the gaps? I think, you know, you know here's how I often frame it to my, to my students. I say to my students, there are still women alive in the United States today who remember what it was like to not be able to vote, to not be able to be on a jury, to not be allowed to join a union, to not to be prohibited from serving in the military, from being excluded from medical school, from law school, from business school, from architecture school, to who were told that women, you know, women had, couldn't drive a car, couldn't have an orgasm. I mean, Think, you know, there are women alive today who remember this. So think about how fast and how far we've come. Does that mean we don't have a lot further to go? Absolutely. But we also have to acknowledge how far we've come because that way I think we can bring men along more readily 
into that conversation. You were also involved in European Commission study, the role of men in gender equality. What were the most surprising results for you? I think the most striking results were the differences and similarities among the different European countries. Of course, now my perspective on this uh, and the, the, the areas in which they focused were predictable, work-family balance, education, violence. Uh, this, what was most striking to me is how similar European countries were on some of these issues. Everybody committed to work-family balance, for example, to, in, to developing policies EU-wide that would enable men to take parental leave to be more involved in family life and how different the European countries were when it came to other issues like, for example, violence. Um, we had, you know, when we've presented some of this material to the European Commission or earlier to uh, the Council of Europe in Strasbourg, for example, um, some of the member countries denied that violence against women even took place in their countries. Some countries had no data None. They had never actually done a survey. The only reliable data they thought they had was police reports or hospital intake interviews that would give them a sense of the extent of violence. So there, there were dramatic differences in the kind of collection of data, the recognition of a problem, the recognition that the problem wasn't simply br brought in. This is a very important problem in, in, in Europe, that the problem of violence against women is not an immigrant problem but also a problem of native-born people in that country. There are many, many gr groups who think that it's simply an immigrant problem and that's what is driving the higher rates of violence. Um, so, so on the one hand, when it comes to work-family balance or even engaging boys in education, there was widespread agreement. But on violence, there was a dramatic difference. Our institute is exploring ways to work on topic of men and gender equality at the European level. Considering the outcomes of the study, what areas would you consider as a priority in the EU? I think there are basically three, uh, three different ways to engage men. Okay? One of them is the, at the policy level to say simply to men, you can't do what you used to do anymore. You know, what you used to do in the workplace, what you used to do on dates, what you used to, you can't do it anymore. It's illegal. You know, the laws around sexual harassment, around sexual assault, for example, all of those um, are basically set constraints for men. But where does that leave men? Men, it leaves men saying, well, we used to do this. We used to want to do this. Now you're saying we can't do this. So they're resentful. Okay, so that's one group. There's another way of approaching it, which is to say, okay, look, the EU is based on the following principles freedom, equality, democracy, individual empowerment, you know, living, you know, choice, all of those kind of neoliberal kinds of terms. So, um, this gender equality is simply in keeping with those values. It is in keeping with the values of fairness and justice and democracy and equality. So, you present to men the ethical imperative. It's right, it's fair, it's just. Well, that doesn't get men particularly motivated. Again, it's experienced as a, as a constraint, an ethical one rather than a normative one. But the third way, the, 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 the approach that I take is, in addition to those two, I think we have to engage men as men to say to them, this is in your interest. You know, right now you face a real dilemma. The ideology of masculinity that you inherited that your father and grandfather taught you, that your friends in school enforced, you know, in whatever ways that they did. That ideology of masculinity does not serve you very well as you move forward into your relationships as a grown-up with your friends, your partners, your children, your spouses. It doesn't serve you well at all. And so you're faced with, with a tension between this ideology to which you may be committed and the life that you're living, which is far more gender equal, far more egalitarian than anything the ideology would have taken you. So you're faced with a kind of choice. Well, what we can show with good data, what we can show, what your index shows, what other projects show, is that supporting gender equality will enable men individually to live happier, more 
more fuller, richer lives. Lives with better relationships with their children, with their partners, with their spouse, um, with their friends. Given the context of current crisis in Europe, what challenges in terms of gender equality do you see ahead for the Europe? I see that here I see a similar, a similar issue in the United States. Now again, the configuration of actors may be different, but the, but the enormous pressure that the, ec the economic crisis has brought to bear on policymakers um, who are desperate to not spend money, who are constrained by all kinds of austerity measures. So now what they're saying, what they're often saying to those of us who are promoting gender equality, is they're likely to say something like, oh, gender equality, that's an expense we can't afford. I mean, that's going to cost too much. We really need to focus all of our energy on the following things, and we can't really, that's, a, that, that's extra. You know, it would be nice, but we can't afford it. I think that's the wrong approach. I think what we need to show clearly through data is that gender inequality is really expensive. I can do this e easily with corporations just around labor cost. If a company has gender equal policies that encourage men and women to work well because they're supported in their family decisions, if they have elderly parents taking time off for, to, to, to deal with sick uh, relatives, to deal with their children, if people feel valued by their company, what are the results? Higher productivity, greater job satisfaction, lower turnover, lower retraining, right? So higher retention, lower turnover. These are enormous costs. So if I can show a company that their costs will go down by implementing gender equality, I have short-circuited that idea that gender equality is too expensive. We can't afford it. What I say to companies and what I would say to governments is, you can't afford gender inequality. Gender inequality is really expensive, right? So if uh, I think we have the data, you have the data in your study to show that. And I think that's the place where we need to be taking that research and we need to be showing it to policymakers in the sense that to say, no, the, 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 this is exactly wrong. The gender equality is actually far less expensive than gender inequality. Maintaining the status quo is more expensive.